Welcome to this program in the Our Finger Lakes History Series. I am Seneca County historian Walter Gable. Although I personally believe that every month should be considered Women's History Month, the reality is that we currently denote March as Women's History Month. And because of that, this program will deal with several ladies with direct Finger Lakes ties. Some are well known, and for them, I hopefully will provide some information about them that might not be as well known. Some of the females in this program are not so well known, but I do think that she, they should be more famous than what is true. I'm going to begin by focusing on some ladies in the women's rights movement and who are thus really quite famous and well-known. Possibly all of you know about these three famous Finger Lakes females shown in this sculpture. This is a sculpture that is on East Baird Street in Seneca Falls, overlooking Van Cleef Lake with the Trinity Episcopal Church in the very background. This sculpture is titled, When Anthony Met Stanton. On the left is Susan B. Anthony. In the center, Amelia Jenks Bloomer. At right is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It shows that of an event on the evening of May 12, 1851. Amelia Bloomer introduced Susan B. Anthony to Elizabeth Cady Stanton in Seneca Falls. Anthony had gone to a large group meeting in Syracuse shortly before May 12th with the hopes that she would personally meet Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but her hoped-for face-to-face meeting didn't happen in Syracuse. Shortly before May 12, 1851, Amelia Bloomer had contacted Anthony, who was in Albany, and invited her to come to Seneca Falls on Anthony's way back from Albany to Rochester. They would, in Seneca Falls, go to an abolitionist meeting at which William Lloyd Garrison and the British abolitionist George Thompson would speak. Bloomer was confident that Stanton would also attend that program, and it would thus provide Bloomer an opportunity in Seneca Falls to introduce Anthony to Stanton. The actual face-to-face meeting did take place on a street corner after the program that evening was over, but not at the street corner at which the famous Bloomer Historic Marker stands today in Seneca Falls. Here you see the five ladies who decided to call the first convention to discuss the need for women's rights. That decision was made at the home of Jane Hunt and her husband Richard. Jane Hunt had invited the four ladies to her home in Waterloo on Sunday, July 9, 1848. She was prompted to have this tea gathering because Martha Coffin Wright, who lived in Auburn, was having her sister Lucretia Mott and husband Thomas Mott stay with Martha as Martha was pregnant. Four of these ladies were Quaker, and then there was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who wasn't Quaker. They were all well acquainted with one another. Jane Hunt knew that this this gathering for tea would provide an opportunity for Elizabeth Cady Stanton to renew her in-person relationship with Lucretia Mott. Actually, it was the first time since their initial friendship meeting in London in 1840 that Stanton and Mott would meet face to face. At London in 1840 at the World Anti-Slavery Convention, where the U.S. female delegates were not seated mainly because, simply because they were females, 
Stanton and Mott had vowed that when they got back to the United States and got settled in, they would take some action to promote publicly their concerns about the inferiority of how women were treated in the United States. You know a great deal about Elizabeth Cady Stanton probably, so I will focus on some less well-known facts and information about her. One of these facts is that she lived in Seneca Falls only from 1847 until 1862. In that year, her husband received a federal government job in New York City, and the family moved there. Elizabeth will live there in New York City the rest of her life and is buried there in New York City. Of course, it is the years while she is living in Seneca Falls that she launched the women's rights movement here in the United States. Elizabeth Cady was a first cousin of Garrett Smith, who was a major abolition and temperance activist, and he was the largest landowner in New York State before the Civil War. It was at Garrett Smith's home that Elizabeth was shown a female fugitive slave there and the beating scars on her back, an event that Elizabeth became convinced to become strongly anti-slavery in her beliefs. It was also at Garrett Smith's home that Elizabeth met Henry Brewster Stanton, an abolitionist speaker. It was at Garrett Smith's home that Elizabeth Cady married Henry Brewster Stanton. This was at least partially because Elizabeth's parents did not approve of their daughter marrying a rather poor Henry. In reciting their marriage vows, Elizabeth did not promise to obey her new husband. In the book, An Uncommon Union, the cover shown here, Author Linda C. Frank emphasizes that Henry encouraged Elizabeth to become a reform activist, be it abolition, temperance, and so on. Although I showed you that sculpture when Anthony met Stanton, Dr. Linda Frank in this book points out that Anthony and Stanton actually had met several years earlier when they were very young but it was a point in their young lives when they were not ready to become the activists in the temperance and anti-slavery and women's rights causes. You may well know that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in 1876 decided that they would compile a history of women's suffrage. Matilda Joslyn Gage worked closely with those two. This was at a time when a split had arisen within the women's rights movement. Some historians, some people at the time, criticized this history of women's suffrage, which consists of a few volumes, as a deliberate attempt by Stanton and Anthony to give their slant on the history of the women's suffrage struggle. Within the women's rights movement, there were major differences of opinion on tactics and goals. Elizabeth Cady Stanton offended many within the women's rights movement when she published her Women's Bible in 1895. It was an effort to remove from the Bible any anti-women's equality wording. By this time, however, Elizabeth Cady Stanton no longer was a real leader officially in the women's rights movement. If you want to learn more about Stanton, I suggest you read her bio autobiography, 80 Years and More. Susan B. Anthony moved with her parents to Rochester in 1845. She was active in the temperance movement. She did not attend the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. 
A popular biography of Susan B. Anthony was written by Lynn Sher. The book is titled, Failure is Impossible. Anthony was one of about a dozen ladies who voted in the 1872 federal elections in Rochester. But don't think she was the first and only female ever to try to vote in federal elections in the United States. She was arrested. Given her already great fame, it was decided that Anthony would be tried for allegedly illegally voting before any of the other arrested Rochester females would go to trial. Anthony's trial for illegally voting was moved to the Ontario County Courthouse in Canandaigua because it was apparent that Anthony had prejudiced virtually all potential jurors in Monroe County when she had spoken in every postal district in that county before it was time to select jurors. Although it was a jury trial in Canandaigua, the presiding judge had a prepared directive in which he told the jury it had to find Anthony guilty. Anthony wouldn't, find the, wouldn't pay the $100 fine assessed, but the judge wouldn't put her in jail. Apparently, he feared the sensational publicity her jailing would create, or more likely even because he wasn't going to give Anthony any grounds on which she could make a legal appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. It wasn't until later that Anthony learned that her fine had been paid by her lawyer. This is the room where it happened. Here you see a picture I took of the actual courtroom in which Susan B. Anthony was tried for illegally voting. It is the courtroom in the Ontario County Courthouse, second floor in Canandaigua. I took this picture just a few years ago. In the rotunda in the U.S. Capitol is this sculpture of Stanton, Anthony, and Lucretia Mott. It is one of the earliest pieces of artwork with a clear women's rights theme to appear anywhere in the entire United States Capitol building. Hopefully we all know that Amelia Bloomer was the first woman newspaper editor publisher. But did you know that she attended the 1848 Women's Rights Convention but did not sign the Declaration of Sentiments. Amelia Bloomer lived in Seneca Falls starting in 1825 in Waterloo. She moved to Seneca Falls in 1840 after marrying Dexter Bloomer, who was the editor and co-owner of the Seneca County Courier newspaper. She would move to Iowa from Seneca Falls in 1853. The newspaper that she edited and published was the Journal of a Female Temperance Society in Seneca Falls. She had been part of a committee of ladies appointed to publish this journal, but soon Amelia Bloomer took on sole responsibility. The publication was called The Lily. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a frequent contributor to issues of the Lily. Rather than using her own name, Elizabeth used the pen name Sunflower. Here you see a picture of Amelia Bloomer in an outfit known as the Bloomer that she wore. In her newspaper, The Lily, Bloomer in 1850-51 popularized awareness of this new outfit that she provi felt provided a more comfortable and practical outfit for women rather than those hooped skirts and so on. Actually, this outfit was introduced into the United States by Elizabeth Smith Miller of Geneva, who I will have more to say about shortly. Martha Coffin Wright spent much of her life 
in Auburn. She was the younger sister, youngest sister of Lucretia Mott. She married and was widowed, then married to David Wright and lived in Aurora, New York. In 1839, they moved to Auburn, where she lived the rest of her life. Martha was one of those five ladies that decided to call the Seneca Falls Convention. Besides all her work in women's rights, she was active in the anti-slavery movement. Her house, which no longer stands in Auburn, was a safe house on the Underground Railroad. She worked closely with Mrs. William Henry Seward in Underground Railroad activities. Something you may also not know, William Lloyd Garrison, Jr. was Martha's son-in-law. At the left, you see the cover of a biography of Martha Coffin Wright. It has the title, A Very Dangerous Woman, a title prompted by the fact that once a lady in Auburn had asked Martha about the many abolitionist speakers who ate at her house. More specifically, the lady wanted to know if Martha allowed Frederick Douglass, who we all know was black, to sit at her dining room table. Martha said yes, and added that she had Frederick sleep as a regular guest when visiting in one of the guest bedrooms of her house. As that lady related this news to other ladies, that lady said that Martha was a very dangerous woman. At right is shown the historic marker on West Genesee Street in Auburn, in front of the site where the Wright House stood. With this person, I am beginning to deal with several other females in alphabetical order. Zobedia Gamby Alleman of Union Springs in 2020 was commemorated with a marker as part of the National Votes for Women trail. She was a lifelong activist for women's rights within Cayuga County and throughout New York State. Zobedia Alleman Gamby, excuse me, Zobedia Gamby was born in a log cabin in the town of Fayette in Seneca County in 1848. Her father, William Gamby II, was a farmer who owned property near McDougal. She married a farmer who decided to study medicine in Michigan, and he practiced medicine in Union Springs from 1886 until his death in 1904. In 1895, she and 11 other women in Union Springs voted in a local election for school board commissioners. Women had been, women in New York State had been allowed this partial suffrage right for school district elections since 1880. One of her major accomplishments was as state chair of the school suffrage committee of the State Women's Suffrage Association in 1910. She used that position to provide leadership in the efforts to secure full suffrage for women in New York State. You probably know that New York State was the first state east of the Mississippi River to give full women's suffrage in 1917. However, prior to 1917, New York State had granted what we call limited suffrage or partial suffrage, such as what I talked about beginning in 1880. I have included here two newspaper article quotes to show how difficult it must have been for her and her colleagues to do the things they did to try to convince all potential male voters to support for whatever referendum was up for consideration that year. Clara Barton is credited as having founded the first chapter of the American Red Cross in Dansville, New York, where she was living at the time. However, it was actually done by several of her friends in Dansville, New York. 
She lived in Dansville, New York from 1876 to 1886. In 1876, Miss Barton entered our home on the hillside, a sanitarium in Dansville, New York. She had been to Dansville earlier on a lecture tour and found it pleasant. Her time at the sanitarium was well-deserved because of the extensive, tiresome work she had done to help with Civil War soldiers missing. Friends and neighbors in Dansville, anxious to honor her in a special way, established the first local society chapter of the American Red Cross on August 22, 1881. Fifty-seven members signed the charter. The Dansville, New York chapter later was renaming itself the Clara Barton Post. Now for some things about Clara Barton that you might not know. Let me begin by saying that she was the first woman to work in a substantial clerk shop job in the federal government with a salary equal to that of a man holding the same job title. She lost that federal job, however, under President James Buchanan. But when Abraham Lincoln was president, she returned to the U.S. Patent Office, but in a lesser job. During the Civil War, she organized an effort to help family members locate more than 22,000 missing soldiers. Antoinette Brown Blackwell was the first woman to be ordained as a mainstream Protestant minister in the United States when she was licensed to preach by the Congregational Church. The year was 1851. She was a minister at the Congregational Church in South Butler. She had graduated from Oberlin College. Oberlin College is the oldest co-educational liberal arts college in the United States. After graduating, she was working for Frederick Douglass's abolitionist paper, mainly writing articles in Rochester. In 1850, she spoke at the first national women's rights convention. Her success with that launched her into a national speaking tour addressing such issues as temperance, abolition, and women's rights. She spoke at many of the subsequent annual national women's rights conventions. This map helps us to understand where South Butler is located, the community in which she was minister of the Congregational Church when she was ordained as a minister. At the bottom is one of the quotes she made as she worked for women's rights throughout the rest of her life. We all know that Elizabeth Blackwell was the first female in the United States to receive a medical degree. And probably we all know that it was granted by the Geneva Medical College, which became part of Hobart College. But do you know how she came to be admitted to Geneva Medical College after having unsuccessfully applied to 29 other medical schools? It was only because the male students at Geneva Medical College, basically as a joke, voted to admit her, assuming that she would prove to be a dismal failure as a medical student. To their surprise, and maybe dismay, she graduated first in her class in 1849. She lost sight in her left eye in November that same year, 1849, when an infant spurted some contaminated solution into her left eye. Dr. Blackwell was an activist in many reform efforts moral reform, sexual purity, personal hygiene, sanitation, medical education, preventative medicine, family planning, 
Christian socialism, and so on. In other words, much more than just woman suffrage. Sarah Hopkins Bradford was an author of children's books, and she wrote the two pioneering biographies of Harriet Tubman. For many years before Hollywood, California, Ithaca, New York was a major location of silent movie making. One star there was Irene Castle. She married Robert E. Treman, a member of a prominent Ithaca family. She met him when she was early on in Ithaca making silent movies. Deviating from alphabetical order for just this one, another noteworthy silent movie actress associated with making silent movies in Ithaca was Pearl Faye White. Pearl White became known as the Serial Queen, making the Elaine serials as well as, well as other seven other serials, a series of movies with the same character. Pearl White was making $10,000 per week in, our, in Ithaca. As the caption to the photo suggests, Pearl White was notorious around Ithaca for her lavish spending, fast driving, and flaunting tradition by wearing slacks and smoking in public. Eileen Collins, who is a graduate of Syracuse University, was the first female commander of a U.S. spacecraft shuttle mission. Emily Parmalee Collins of South Bristol was the first woman in the United States to establish a society focused on women's suffrage and women's rights. Building upon her attending the Seneca Falls Convention in July 1848, Collins organized the Women's Equal Rights Union of South Bristol, and that organization is also known by different names. Ann Dunwoody is the first woman in the United States Uniformed Services to achieve the rank or equivalent of a four-star officer general. She spent many summers with her grandparents in the Sheldrake Kidders area, and she graduated from State University College at Cortland. The Fox sisters, especially the younger two of the three, were largely responsible for the start of spiritualism, the belief that spirits of the dead can communicate with the living. Kate and Margaret Fox became well-known mediums for this spiritualism, starting in the later 1840s. The Fox sisters were living with their parents in the small house in Hydesville, which is just north of Newark, New York. In the next inductions, Emily Howland will be one of the newest inductees into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She spent much of her life in Sherwood, New York, where she was an abolitionist and an edu activist for educating blacks and a strong promoter of women's rights. She was a close friend of Harriet Tubman. Tubman would frequently go to Holland's home where t when Tubman was beset with personal worries. Emily Howland was the first woman to receive an honorary degree from SUNY Albany. Mary Jemison is known as the white woman of the Genesee. At an early age, she was captured by Indians and became assimilated into Seneca Indian life. She chose to remain an Indian rather than return to white culture. Shown at top left is a statue of her in Letchworth State Park. I hope I'm going to pronounce this name properly. Jaconsasa is known as the mother of nations among Indians. She was instrumental in the formation of the Iroquois Confederacy. 
Elizabeth Smith Miller of Geneva was a major activist for women's rights and political equality. She was the daughter of Garrett Smith and thus a cousin of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth Smith Miller is the one who introduced the Turkish outfit into the United States, the outfit that became known as the Bloomer. Elizabeth Smith Miller and her daughter Anne Fitzhugh organized View as a summer women's cultural and nat nature retreat on Seneca Lake, south of Lodi Point. Here you see a picture of Elizabeth Smith Miller at right and her daughter Ann Fitzhugh Miller on the left. Elizabeth Miller, Miller and daughter Ann Fitzhugh lived in Geneva, New York. In Geneva, they or, were very active in the Geneva Political Equality Club and other reformist groups. The Miller ladies, as well as other prominent females in Geneva, and some men, were instrumental in creating a summer camp on the east shore of Seneca Lake. This summer camp became known as Fossenview or Queen's Castle. It, apply, it, placed, it provided a place for recreation and sharing of intellectual ideas. Several prominent people, including Susan B. Anthony, visited there. Formed on November 30, 1897, by a group including the mother-daughter team Elizabeth and Ann Miller, the Geneva Political Equality Club became a forum for discussing current events and educating the public about issues related to women's rights. The Millers used their connections to bring nationally and internationally known suffragists to Geneva, including Susan B. Anthony, Carrie Chapman Catt, and Emmeline Pankhurst. Under Anne's leadership, the Geneva Political Equality Club became the largest club in the state of New York, with 333 members in a community of only about 10,000 people. She and other members also helped to form political equality clubs throughout Ontario County. Following the success of their suffrage campaign in 1917, the Geneva Club spawned both the Geneva Women's Club and the local chapter of the League of Women Voters. Esther Hobart McQuig Slack Morris is probably the key female responsible for securing woman suffrage in Wyoming Territory. She was born near Owego, New York. In 1870, she was the first female to hold a judicial position in the United States. She got woman suffrage in Wyoming Territory, and I think she should be nominated did for induction into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Here is a recent children's book about Esther Morris. I love the title, I Could Do That. Frances Seward, the wife of Henry William Seward, should be famous because of what she did in terms of the Underground Railroad. Mrs. Seward tend to spend, tended to spend most of her time in Auburn whilst her husband was U.S. Senator and then Secretary of State. Both she and her husband were strong abolitionists. They used their home as a safe house on the Underground Railroad. She worked closely with Martha Coffin Wright in an Auburn network. You've probably never heard of Mrs. Permelia's story of Hector, New York. Here I am reporting that in June 1864, she went to the White House to talk to President Abraham Lincoln. When she got back home to Hector, New York, she told the local folk that she spent two hours with President Lincoln. There is much to this story, however. Mrs. Permelia's story returned to Hector, tells the local residents 
of her two hours visiting with Lincoln. The local folk don't believe her. They had always perceived of her as somewhat odd. Also, most pe people had never been very far away, certainly not to Washington, D.C., surely not to the White House and talking to the president, so they found it rather unbelievable that this lady could have managed to take up two hours of President Lincoln's precious time during the last stages of the war. However, at some point after that, Secretary of State William Henry Seward was traveling from Washington, D.C., back home to his wife in Auburn, New York. Mr. Seward had a layover in Watkins, and during that layover, he overheard the local folk jokingly, jokingly talking about that crazy area lady who said she talked with President Lincoln in the White House. Seward spoke up to report that the story was true because the president had told Seward all about it. In his conversation with them, Seward reported that Lincoln had told him that, quote, big tears rolled down his cheeks. He also said that Lincoln had commented, quote, there was enough patriotism in Mrs. Story to replenish one of the southern states, unquote. Seward's also said that Lincoln considered her visit very positively, saying, quote, she whiled away two of the most pleasant hours it had been my lot to enjoy since I entered the president's office. Sadly, I haven't been able to locate any picture of Mrs. Story. I trust that each of you here knows a great deal about Harriet Tubman, the most famous conductor of passengers on the Underground Railroad. She was called the Moses of the People. A good biography of Tubman is Kate Clifford Larson's book, Bound for the Promised Land. Her 2005 biography was the first one written for an adult audience since 1843. And it gives us a much more than partly fictionalized biography of Harriet Tubman that is so familiar to school children today. Larson documented that Harriet Tubman, as a conductress on the Underground Railroad, personally brought only about 70 individuals in approximately 13 trips to freedom. This is a number far less than the totals given in other books and accounts. But Larson does emphasize that Tubman encouraged many other enslaved persons to decide to escape. Significantly at the time, a reward of $40,000 was placed on Tubman. When the Civil War broke out in April 1861, Tubman saw a Union victory as a key step towards the abolition of slavery. In 1862, she began her work in the Civil War as a cook, a nurse, a laundress, a teacher, a scout, and a spy for the Union forces stationed in the Hilton Head District of South Carolina. Her knowledge of covert travel and subterfuge among potential Indians, excuse me, of potential enemies that she acquired had acquired while leading enslaved peoples through the marshes and river area of the eastern shore of Maryland, those skills helped Harriet Tubman to be an important military guide in the marshy areas of South Carolina in the Civil War. It was not until late in her life that she began to receive a pension income from the U.S. government for her Civil War service. In the Combahee River Raid on June 2, 1863, Harriet Tubman became the first woman to lead military forces in an armed raid when she guided the troops of Colonel Montgomery, the commanding officer. In this raid, she routed the rebel forces and freed over 700 slaves. 
burned buildings, crops, and destroyed stockpiles of munitions and food. By the 1890s, Harriet Tubman became an advocate for women's rights, especially that of black women. The Harriet Tubman Historical Park in Auburn, New York, has several parts to it. Like the National Park in Maryland, the park in Auburn, Auburn deals with sites associated with Harriet Tubman while she lived in Auburn the balance of her life after the Civil War. This is the church building that Harriet attended in Auburn for many years. It is the only property in, owner, in Auburn that is owned by the National Park Service. The other properties in Auburn associated with Harriet are owned by the AME Zion Church. She initially had a home for the aged called John Brown Hall. The African Methodist Episcopal Church held on to the property and then built a new structure. Then they rebuilt one structure and opened it to the public as a museum preserving the humanitarian vision of founder Harriet Tubman. The building shown here is the restoration of this second building known as the Tubman Home for the Aged and Infirm Negroes, and it's where Harriet Tubman actually died. Here are pictures of her gravestone that I took February 14, 2020. Note carefully that the front side of the gravestone at top simply has her name, while the back side contains information about her accomplishments. In March 2019, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture unveiled this circa 1868 photo of Harriet Tubman. It is the youngest known photo of Harriet Tubman. Harriet is in her 40s in this photo. The Smithsonian and the Library of Congress had acquired this photo album in which the photo was at an auction with a selling price of $161,000. The photo album belonged to Emily Holland, who I had talked about earlier. It was, she was gifted this all album by her friend Carrie Nichols on New Year's Day, 1864. Both were teaching at the Camp Todd School on Robert E. Lee's Arlington Estate at the time. Note how the photo of a younger Harriet Tubman was largely embraced for historical accuracy in the 2019 movie Harriet. Dr. Mary Edwards Walker of Oswego is the only female that has ever received the Medal of Honor. It was awarded for her work during the Civil War because she was a female, but because she was a female, she could not get a position as a surgeon in the U.S. Army, even though she was a graduated medical doctor. In 1917, there was an official attempt to take back her Medal of Honor but Dr. Mary Walker wouldn't part with it. She continued to wear it proudly as her rather unusual outfit. She didn't wear traditional female style clothing. She did wear long pants and something that looked like a man's suit with a top hat. Narcissa Prentice was born in Plattsburgh, New York. In February 1836, Narcissa Prentice married Marcus Whitman. I think they loved one another dearly, but to some extent it was also a marriage of convenience. Narcissa wanted to be a missionary in the far west, but couldn't get funding from a national church board because she was a single female. A month after their marriage, Mar Marcus and Narcissa Whitman set out with another couple to journey overland to establish a mission in the Oregon country. 
These two monuments help point out that Narcissa Prentice Whitman and Eliza Spalding on that trip were the first two white ladies to cross the Rocky Mountains. The Whitmans set up their missionary mission at Wyalapu near Walla Walla, Washington today. They were only so-so successful in converting local Indians to Christianity, but their mission became a major stopping place on the Oregon Trail. Narcissa Whitman gave birth in March 1837 to the first white child born in the Oregon country, first U.S. white child <clears throat> born in the Oregon country. Narcissa and her husband and one other and 11 others were killed by Indians in 1847. However, their accomplishments helped establish the basis for the U.S. claim to the Oregon Territory. Jemima Wilkinson is known as the Universal Friend, and her followers established a settlement in Yates County that became known as New Jerusalem, or simply Jerusalem. On that settlement was the first wooden frame house in western New York. By March 1790, her new Jerusalem community settlement had 260 individuals, making it the largest settlement in western New York at the time. This settlement had a grist mill that provided a badly needed service for farmers from a great distance, including parts of what is today Seneca County. As I end this program, I want to highlight the two things I have been doing in this program. First, for those females who are rather well known, I have tried to point out some information about them that might not be so well known. Second, I have provided information about some ladies with direct Finger Lakes ties who you may not have known about before this program, but I think they should be more famous than they are. I hope this information has been useful. Their stories of, for these Finger Lakes females is another important part of our Finger Lakes history. <laughs>